Your check from President Trump will soon be in the mail. I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. This episode brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com, as well as our friends at the Patriot Post, who are right now offering their free Patriots Primer on American Liberty. You can download that when you sign up for their email list. Just go to the link in the description below. Uh, Bill, there's a lot of talk in Washington, D.C., bipartisan talk for that matter, about sending money directly to American citizens as part of an overall relief package. Uh, the overall relief package that's being proposed... Uh, by uh, Steve Mnuchin at the Department of Treasury with the president's blessing is some trillion dollars of federal spending, 250 billion of which is slated to be payments to individual Americans. Uh, but Bill, there are a couple of questions that come up when you think of being a conservative in the context of a bailout. First of all, at first blush, what do you think about the idea of the federal government seizing on a crisis like this to send checks to individual Americans? Well, Putting aside the severity of this for a minute, because there's a still a lot of debate about whether this has been kind of oversold or not. Uh, this is without question, I think, a national emergency. And in national emergencies, I think the federal government is, is not only uh, uh, morally permitted, but also th this, is why, this is why we have governments. Um, now, Cash bailouts are, are, are tricky business. First of all, I suppose to put all of this in context, we need to remember that we are at any given time in this country writing hundreds of, really probably writing a trillion dollars of checks just giving people money. So we're talking about including people who are gonna be hurt by this, um, by this enforced sort of societal uh, isolation and so on. So I, I tend to think that in, in a case like this, in a case of an emergency, this is the kind of thing that the government actually should be doing. I just wish they weren't doing it when it wasn't an emergency. Uh, so that's my initial take on it. Bill, there was uh, you know, a lot of talk in 2008 that the federal government shouldn't be bailing out big corporations. Um, and, and that is, of course, part of this relief package as well. But Republican senators and congressmen are now making the argument that the corporations that got bailed out in 2008 were corporations that actually got themselves into the difficulty. But in this case, it's no fault, for example, of the airline industry uh, that were in this pickle. And it's no fault of the individual workers who might be receiving these stipends from the federal government, uh, that they're in the path of a pandemic. Um, does that square with conservative thinking on this matter? No, I, I categorically see there's a difference, Scotty, that let's just take the term corporate um, malfeasance, for lack of a better word. If your company is mismanaged and you go out of business, if your company is dependent on a model like Solyndra, where you are Part of your business model is to take government handouts and so on. And if you're in a situation like many of the automakers were uh, back almost uh, 10 years ago now, a little over, um, where the contractual obligations they had to their unions were so great that they could no longer manufacture cars at a profit. All of those things are structural problems within the company and those companies need to fail. Uh, Going back to the arguments that were made back in the days of the initial stimulus package back in 2008, bankruptcy for a company does not mean that the company, I'm talking about non-pandemic now, uh, does not mean that the company's vaporized and that they bulldoze down the, the, um, the, the factory. And it, it means that the company can legally restructure certain agreements and so on that they had in place. But yes, those are the, the fault of the company. And part of the reason that the free market works when you let it work, is because badly run businesses go out of business. They simply don't have the ability to compete against uh, businesses that are better run, offering better products, better services at lower prices. So when you bail out a bad company, all you're doing is you're, you're removing the natural selection aspect of the free market that makes such uh, an effective uh, device out of the free market. But this is entirely different, and it's entirely different for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's entirely different because, as you pointed out, this is not a result of mismanagement of restaurants or, or of airline companies or anything else. This is by this is practically the definition of an act of God uh, in terms of, of that aspect of it. I think the second reason that this is important is that there doesn't seem to be any real financial flaw. I'm speaking in, in the most general terms now. It's not like you're bailing out a company that is going to fail again 
and, and will continue to need bailouts. We're talking about getting people through a period of time of enforced isolation in order to save lives. You can make the argument, and people have made it, and, and there is some substance to this argument, that the economic damage uh, that's being done is, is worse than any of the, uh, of the damage in, in terms of lives in the long term. But, you know, I don't know if that's really an American uh, way of looking at things, just to be as, as honest as I can be about it. Our military has always believed that if there's one person in trouble and we have to send in 30 guys to go rescue that guy, we'll do it. And if we lose the 30 guys rescuing them, it doesn't matter. What matters is the sanctity of the individual and the individual life. So we are now taking a tremendous economic hit, not to protect the vast majority of the population that will not be in any way affected by COVID-19 in the long term. And that's just based on the statistical data that's here so far. But we are making enormous uh, efforts and we are in uncharted territory uh, and taking an enormous economic hit in order to protect those elements of our society that are vulnerable. And we're talking about millions of people here now, millions. And I find that to be worth the 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 hardship i i just genuinely do bill, bill there are two arguments being made for for giving cash payments to individual citizens one is a compassionate argument that there are people who are or will be out of work as a result of these sort of shelter in place orders that are uh, gradually coming to us as well as just things having been shut down like restaurants and bars and gymnasiums and and museums and government offices and things like that so there's the compassion argument, but I'm also hearing Republicans making a stimulus argument that basically saying we need to give a shot in the shoulder to the U.S. economy, which has been so heavily hit. And so that these this, you know, $250 billion worth of cash payments into the pockets of individual Americans will have a stimulative effect. It was not so long ago, Bill, that the, the same party was saying that's like scooping water out of one end of the swimming pool and dumping it in the other. Um, which is it? I completely agree that the, that the stimulus argument is is nonsense. Um, the country doesn't need an economic stimulus. The economy was cranking and booming and the economy is healthy and so is the American uh, job market and the American economic situation. It is, there is a, 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 an 800 pound gorilla sitting on the economy now in the form of this, of this virus that is artificially suppressing economic activity and the economy doesn't need a stimulus. It doesn't need money to kick it off. If you simply say the crisis has passed, all of these bans on travel and all of this stuff are now removed and that day will come, we don't know when, but it will come, bang. It's not only gonna come back to what it was, I think it's gonna have in fact a, a, a rebound effect and, and grow even stronger than it was before. So if you're talking about, oh, well, we should take some money for people who can't pay their rent, I'm in favor of that in case of an emergency. And if you're saying we should also take money, additional money, and pour that into some kind of stimulus idea, then not only am I opposed to that, but I think if you've got that stimulus money on hand, that should be made available to the people who need it in order to get them through this crisis. The people, look, I'm not assigning any moral uh, uh, weights to any of what I'm about to say, but basically, in a nutshell, when you, when you have this kind of situation, you are basically telling people not to go to work. And that's why this economy is, is, in, is taking such a big hit because people are being told don't go to work. The people who are already not at work are not affected by this. The people who are affected are the people who get up every morning and, and, and go to work and they, and they put in these hours and they commute back and forth. And now it's not a question of these people don't wanna to go to work, they simply can't. So these are the producers that we're talking about. These are the people that make things go, the people that make things go around. They're for everything from, from, uh, you know, from teachers, uh, uh, people who work in insurance companies, all of this stuff. It's not like they don't want to work. They want to work, and and as soon as this weight of of the of the government restrictions on uh, travel and assembly and so on, once those things pass, as the virus runs its course, it runs its course, then those things will come back and be healthy. They will not need additional bailouts. And if you simply keep the workers going, keep the people. I don't like the term workers actually. If you keep the American people going and optimistic then we get through this as fast as we can. And we do, I think we see a big economic rebound on the other side, but we don't need to pump money into the economy to have an economic rebound. This isn't 
2008. And furthermore, it's not even two, it's not even 2012. This is not Obama's economy. This economy is humming. And it was humming right up until the day that, that people began to realize that this virus was going to knock economic activity in this country way, way down. And not just for two or three days, but for probably two or three months. And that's probably a conservative estimate. So, you know, what this is, Scott, it, it's like, and, and I think there's something to this. The, the Victorians put it as usual in, in pretty blunt terms, but they basically talked about the poor and then the deserving poor. And, and the distinction that they made was that, um, was that if a woman, uh, for, as an example, got divorced, and I understand these are harsh terms, so I'm just trying to tell you how the, the, the kind of the moral logic works. If a woman got divorced and she just decided she didn't want to be there anymore, and she was, th that woman would suffer a great deal of shame and ostracization, and she wouldn't get a whole lot of help. If on the other hand, that same woman had a husband who died leading a cavalry charge, you know, in, in, in uh, Natal or something in 1879, then that person would be considered the deserving poor. They would be, and the distinction would be, that, they're, that the, the dire circumstances that they are in are no fault of their own and through no uh, action of their own could they have prevented them. And this to me seems like a, a very clear cure, a very clear cut case of that. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not trying to put throw any moral weights on things other than to say that we don't have a problem with people suddenly deciding not going to work and we don't have a problem with the economy not working. We now have a short term issue where the, where the economy is, to many extents, simply shut down artificially. When I say artificially, I mean for non-economic reasons. And they're doing this to save lives. And since we are doing this to save lives, I think we're all in this together. The American people are all in this together. And I think it's a legitimate use of, of taxpayer money because it is for... Um, it's for the, com the, the common welfare, for the greater welfare of, the, of all people who benefit from this. You could say, you could say, and, and I think there are places where this is actually happening. You could basically say, hey, you know what? We can't afford to do this. We don't want to spend this taxpayer money. We don't want to take this kind of economic hit. So, you know, this virus is going to spread and 95, oh, sorry, 98, 99% of the people out there are going to get mild flu symptoms and continue working, but it will affect the people who are at risk. And we may lose two, three million people as, as a result of that. That kind of argument could be made, but I don't, I don't want to live in a society that is making a cost benefit analysis on the lives of people that could be saved. Although, although there does come a point where you are now talking about a case where the remedy is, is worse than the cure. We discussed that before on the idea that, you know, it, you could basically eliminate traffic deaths by making sure nobody drove anywhere ever again in cars, buses, or whatever. Comes a point when it becomes more harmful than good. But in a case like this, helping people who are hardworking people who didn't even ask for the help, I might point out, in terms of like, you know, that, that aspect of it, to me, I think is a necessary part of us dealing with this. And for people who have a problem with, with the, with the spending and the, and the, just the budgetary aspects of it, I would urge you to consider this defense spending. I, I, I mean it. We, we spend an, an, a significant amount of money every year on the nation's defense to protect our citizens. And we do that for appropriate reasons. And I'm a big fan of defense spending because I kind of cherish the freedoms that we have here. But you could certainly make the case that this is a, a, a an invasion of the American way of life. This is not a, a change in what we decide to do or how we decide to do it. We have in fact have got now alien invaders on the shore of this country and we need to do something to save American lives. And, and that's why we pay for aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines and, and, and F-35s and all the rest. So I don't see this as a handout. And if I did, I'd have, an, I'd have a completely different view of it. But I, I don't see this as a handout. I see this as a, a, a compensation for external political pressures that have caused businesses enormous economic damage and will continue to. And, and, and it's not going to the owners of the companies, really. This is to, to, the, to the workers so that they can basically make their rent and pay their bills and so on. And I, and I would like to say one, one more thing about that aspect, the second aspect of it. Traditionally, in a crisis, what you see is price gouging. That, that seems to be the, 
the, the dark side of humanity, when people are wiped out and they don't have any water and now you've got some water and you're selling a bottle of water for $200 and that kind of thing. But not only am I not seeing that, um, I'm seeing the opposite of that. Uh, just as one example, Uber Eats, which delivers food to people, has decided to cut their delivery charge, the money they just charged to actually organize delivering the money to go to food. It's not the food cost, it's not the tip to the driver, it's the delivery charge. Uber Eats has said that they're going to they're going to eliminate the delivery charge for the duration of the crisis. A, there is no delivery charge added to it. Now, whether or not that makes a big difference in terms of whether you can order the food or not, it, to me is less important than the attitude. And I seem to be seeing that everywhere. That everybody is just really being very cool and forgiving about this. I don't see anybody looking at this as an opportunity to gouge people with the exception of the news media, obviously. And, and other than that, I, I think that this is a legitimate case for expenditure of government funds in the case of a federal emergency. This is not a state issue. This is not a local issue. This is a national emergency. And I just wish that the federal government had been better run prior to this, because if we had, this would be a surplus that we would be having instead of adding to this deficit. And that's why we have the money available in the first place. I don't know if this is being caused by the surge of people working out of their homes or more people having to remain home, but the network connection that we have between Texas in my studio and Bill's studio in California is really shaky right now. So we're going to draw this episode to a close and thank the members at BillWhittle.com for faithfully continuing to support this effort, including the new members who have joined within the last couple of days. We know that you value these principles and that they're not just ideas for you, that they actually have consequences. And so we apply those fundamental principles and ideas every day to the breaking news of the day, five times a week on Bill Whittle Now and five times a week on Right Angle. And you can check that all out at BillWhittle.com. You can join the producer's team by going to BillWhittle.com and clicking that Become a Member link. And you can help our friends over at the Patriot Post as they help us by clicking the link in the description below and getting your free primer, the Patriot's Primer on American Liberty, right now. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.